Hello, this is Dr. Halisa Elwin. As a founding member of the Hebraic Roots Network, I hope that you'll consider a monthly support so that the Torah can go forth to the nations. There are three levels of support. There's a partner at $20 per month. There's Gideon's Army at $50 per month. Or you can participate as the Tabernacle Team at $100 per month. You can pledge this support at www.hebraicnetworks.com or at 1-800-657-9820. We thank you for any support that you can give, and may Adonai bless your home richly. Hello, welcome to the Creation Gospel. We continue our study in the Scarlet Harlot and the Crimson Thread, which is Workbook 4. And if you're trying to follow along today, I believe we'll be starting around page 97. Page 97. Just to sum up the, the information from the last program, we looked at the harlot, whether she was or not might be in question, Rahab. And we look at the work that she did in regard to that crimson thread in continuing that pattern of the matriarchs and women such as Tamar. In doing so, we can make some assessments about her work, about Rahab, because, you know, in, the, in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, there's a whole hall of faith that lists those who did courageous acts who acted in faith, and the Torah followed. Sometimes it was a person who grew up in the Torah, who grew up with the land, the covenant, and the people, but sometimes it was people who did not have that advantage. It might have been the stranger, the Nakriah, like Rahab, or like Ruth, who had to learn it in adulthood. And rather than despairing of them ever, learning what it means to walk in covenant, Instead, they are held up as examples of what faith can do. It can increase your learning exponentially. And if you've been studying the Torah for a few years, and you've been studying diligently, what you might have noticed is that the increase in your learning is so much greater than it ever was when you tried to learn something else. It's as though the more you invest in learning God's Word, the faster you can learn it. I tell you what, I can learn the Torah much faster than I can learn algebra, which there again, my motivation might have something to do with that. But there is a reward for people like Ruth and for Rahab, who may have come into the covenant lately, but who have been very diligent and they have served others. They have manifested chesed, loving kindness, in the Torah that they did know, and their reward was more. They learned more. They were brought into covenant relationship and status within the land, within the people. And they're held as icons of faith for others to follow. Now, just to assess Rahab, to sum up what we learned about her, we know that she was a virtuous, courageous woman with a scarlet cord. We know that she aided and abetted the return of the promised children of Israel to a promised land. So you can help the children back, or you can try to throw roadblocks before the children going back. That's not going to change the outcome, whether you participate or obstruct. The difference is going to be in you and your outcome. That they will go back has already been decided. Whether you go back with them, that may not be so clear. It might need to be clarified in your own mind and heart. We know that Rahab covered the messengers with the stalks of flax. Remember, the flax is what you make the linen from. Like the virtuous woman, she covers her household in linen. Well, Rahab, she may not have the woven linen. She may not have reached that point yet in terms of her coverings, 
but it, she does what she has, and she, she's drying these stalks of flax, so she covers the spies with those. She covers figuratively the household of Adonai. When you receive a messenger from Israel, just like Yeshua said, if they will receive you in my name, then let your blessing rest on that house. But if they reject you, then you're going to shake the dust off of your feet. There was one household that, that welcomed the messengers of Yehoshua. And by that covering, by that symbolic act, I will cover these on behalf of all. That was honored. She redeemed her household by her faith. In other words, she didn't say, just save me. They said, we'll save your entire household. If you'll bring them into your house and not set foot out into the street, hang this cord out your window. And there again, there's that super, how in the world did a house and a wall not collapse and kill everyone inside? You talk about faith. When those walls started crumbling, I have to think that there might have been, you know, a little negative thought come into the minds of those gathered in that household if you see the entire walls or at least feel them collapsing around you. But they were steadfast. They were steady. They remained within the household and they were saved. So her acts were part of the redemption of her household. We know that she married into the covenant. She found a covenant partner because it says she's in the midst of Israel to this day. So she had offspring within the covenant. She acquired a husband. You know, and, and that is another picture of Sukkot of the nations. At that particular time, we are commanded to welcome not just the stranger, the alien, but the orphan and the widow. Those who are in need of a husband those who have really no covenant relationship. They are given that opportunity at Sukkot to acquire a husband in Israel. She became part of the people of the covenant, and there again, that action of the matriarchs is to stretch those tent pegs. That's exactly what Rahab does when she incorporates her family into the children of Israel, it's expanding. Remember, it's broadening the perspective. That's what the function of the Ruach HaKodesh is in the plan, in the plan of salvation, in the gospel plan, in the returning of the nations at Sukkot. It is to broaden the perspective. And you see that in Revelation, that it's every nation, tribe, and tongue. But it's not just any old person. It's those who have been redeemed, those who have that scarlet thread. And there again, she produces offspring within the covenant. So whatever she's doing, whatever Torah she knows, it is helping her to produce offspring, to bear fruit within the covenant. So Rahab is a great example, just like Ruth, of how the stranger whether it's the stranger outside the land or the stranger coming into the land, like Rahab already living inside the land. They have to make those declarations. They have to make those decisions concerning the land, the covenant, and the people. Why is Israel and its people under such attack generation after generation after generation? Because people's hearts are being tested. Are you a Rahab, a harlot? Are you a Rahab, a virtuous woman? That's a decision. That's a declaration that every single person has to declare. Now, remember, and it never hurts to keep rereading Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman. If you understand it's a parable of the Holy Spirit, you can look at it with different eyes than just you know, looking at something you might read as a blessing on Erev Shabbat. Because the text of Proverbs 31, it describes the work of the Holy Spirit more completely in one spot than we get spread out over a lot of other places. Although basically the whole book of Proverbs is describing the work of the Holy Spirit and contrasting it with those who seem to be devoid 
of any influence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Uh, so reviewing that frequently is always a good idea. That virtuous woman, she is a, a parable of the Holy Spirit. And her family, it says, are clothed in scarlet. It says in uh, verse 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. There again, there's that flax. There's the covering of the linen for the household. Her clothing, fine linen and purple. There's scarlet. Remember, the only way you're going to produce the purple for clothing is to take the blue of heaven, to take the authority of heaven, the spirit, and to mix it with the red of the nefesh, which is your appetites, emotions, desires, and your intellect, and the resulting color is purple. It's completely blue, but it's also completely red. It's, it's not so much a blend, it just is purple. So Rahab, in covering those spies, she's basically covering her household with linen. She's covering them with scarlet, the scarlet thread. And she is producing purple people in her household. You want purple people in your household because that tells you that these people have come under the authority of heaven. They are now under the authority of the Holy One of Israel. They're not out there just running roughshod like the scarlet harlot. They're red is actually producing a purple character because that nefesh has been subdued under the blue, under the ruach. So we have there the picture of the blue of the water, but the red of the blood. These three things bear witness. All right. In the Song of Songs, the scarlet is seen behind the veil. It's a covering. Remember reading that? That the, the virtuous woman, she provides coverings for her household. Well, listen to what it says in the Song of Songs, where that scarlet is seen behind the veil, what is said of that. Because remember, lips are a threshold. Lips are like an altar. An altar represents authority. When your lips speak, they're crossing a threshold that basically is revealing whose authority you are under. When your words come out, it's telling people who you are and who you serve, most of all. So you've got that gateway of the lips. In Song of Songs 4.3, it says, your lips are like a scarlet thread. Interesting, huh? Remember the scarlet thread that hung out of the window? Remember the, the cord that Judah gave to Tamar? Remember the redemptive cord of the secondborn for the firstborn? It says, your lips are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. Lovely is what Miriam's mouth was after she had seven days on the outside of the camp. It completely transformed that gateway. He says, your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. Well, now that's such an interesting description because in the Song of Songs, you see that that lover is coming to maturity. The bride is coming to maturity for her husband. And some evidence of that is that those lips are speaking the mature words, the words of a bride. And it says they are like a scarlet thread. They demonstrate that your nefesh has been redeemed. That's a beautiful picture. And now it, it helps us to understand why Miriam had such a great accountability for her speech. A righteous woman's lips are very important because they are doing that redemptive work of Messiah. They're like a scarlet thread. They're providing redemption for a household. They're providing a way to allow the children of Israel to come back home to their land. 
every word that comes out of our mouths can be part of that redemptive work or it can be obstructive. When Miriam was obstructive, she found herself marked with leprosy. But when she was constructive, she was a leader. She led the women. She was a song leader. She praised. She danced. We have to speak the good news of that spiritual Torah. This is a faithful witness from a faithful wife. This is a virtuous woman. She is a witness. When her words become harsh or when her speech becomes bloody, that's when she's speaking like a harlot. But when she speaks redemption and the good news, that's when she is her, the bride of her husband. See, we can't rebel against the Holy Spirit that was put in us to proclaim salvation. When the words speak contrary to the Ruach that is in us, there may be a breakout. And see where that leprosy may be a death sentence to the unrepentant, on one who recognizes that I spoke evil words, I spoke negative words, malignant words, and you repent of those words, then you come back in and you're a little wiser and you're a little more mature and you're much more ready to speak the redemptive good news out of that same mouth than you were rebellion and evil. The virtuous woman, she's a helper and she, she creates a safe house. Just like Rahab, she created a safe house for her family. Ruth created a safe house for Naomi. That's what a woman does. That's what a wise woman does. When she is moving at the power of the Holy Spirit, she creates a safe house for her husband, for her family, for Israel itself. And because of that, if we want to be wise women, what we want to do is infuse our observance of the Sabbath and the Moedim with the Ruach HaKodesh so that the words we're speaking at these Moedim and on these Shabbats, and not just then, but especially then, that they are redemptive words, that we're pouring those beautiful words into the Moedim. So if there are strangers who are still living in the walls or riding the fence, they're still lukewarm, we can help them make a better decision because there will come a day when the wall won't save them and neither will the fence. The lukewarm won't be any good. It needs to be hot or cold. Isaiah, in Isaiah 1.13, he describes the lips that can be those weapons of destruction because remember, devar is the word Devarim our words. When we speak destructive words, we can bring on the devar, the pestilence on a beast, on ourself, the marks that are on a beast. He says in Isaiah 1.13, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. Wow, there's something going on in these feasts and these Shabbats. It's not good. He's calling it an abomination. In other words, it looks more like the wicked lamp instead of the holy lamp. He's seeing more proud eyes, more lying tongues, more hands that shed innocent blood more hearts devising wicked plans, more feet running to evil, more false witnesses, more separation of brothers than he's seeing the fruit of the Holy Spirit in these Shabbats and these assemblies. He says, I can't endure that solemn assembly. That should make us ashamed. That should make us evaluate. What am I saying when I gather with the saints? Are my lips like a scarlet thread of redemption with the good news? Or are they destroying those within the household? Are they destroying the Cushites? Are they destroying the strangers who have made declarations, but maybe they don't look like us? Maybe they don't speak the same language naturally. There may be a lot of things on the exterior about them that are different but they're part of the body. We need to be careful. 
He says, I hate, I hate, hate your new moon festivals. Wow. And your appointed feasts, your, your Moedim. He says, they have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. Wow. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. That's pretty intense. See, if we can celebrate a feast, a new moon, or a Sabbath, and what we're saying and what we're doing is displeasing to the Father, it's worthless. It's light. It has no value to him. In fact, not only does it have no value, he sees it as a burden. What used to bring him joy and happiness when his children would come together at his appointed times, he's saying, I hate it. I despise it. When Israel takes that scarlet thread of redemption from death, and they burn it with the hyssop, and a heifer that has borne no burden, no burden, these feasts to the Father, they have become a burden. This red heifer is one who has borne no burden. She's paid a redemption price. In connection with the Moedim, then there is cleansing water that separates her from the death of contaminations that occur in the tent of the Moedim. There is cleansing. Be careful how you're judging the exterior of other people. Be careful that you're not separating people who should be walking together. Because, yes, you can walk all the way to the temple, but that's where you're going to find that cleansing water of the red heifer. You're going to walk in faith. And when you arrive, that's where someone is going to teach you more perfectly the Torah and help you to understand in those areas where the idolatry is still clinging to you. They're going to pre preach that good news to you. It's going to be like a scarlet thread of cleansing. It's not going to be like a scourge. And that's going to help enlarge the tent. It's not an exclusionary Torah. It is an inclusionary. All that is required is that you submit and learn. Be willing to learn. He says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. How do you do that? Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. See what he says? You learn to do good. You're not born knowing how to do good. Some things you do. They're just instinctual. Other things must be learned from the Torah. Learn to do good. Learn what it really says. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan and plead for the widow. He's telling you right there how to learn to do good. He's not telling you a new way to calculate a calendar or a new moon. You can do that and he can hate it. He's telling you what he loves. When his children come to worship him at the appointed times, He's not interested in hearing you correct one another's Hebrew pronunciation. That's a burden to him. He's weary of it. It's worthless. What does he want? He says, here's what you can do. Seek justice. Be fair with one another. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Those who come in and they have lack, he's saying, minister to those people. If you were coming into a moed or you were coming into a Shabbat to serve yourself, to multiply your prayers, to make yourself look more righteous or more correct, that can be a weary thing to him. 
It is a weary thing to him. He wants you to learn how to engage the Moedim the way he commanded. Just like he said at Sukkot, bring the stranger. They'll be there with the Levite. The Levite will teach them the Torah. That's why he says, learn to do good. When you come into these Moedim, it is to learn to do good. It doesn't mean you arrive and you have already proven all things and know all things. You're going to learn, no matter how sophisticated and literate in the Torah you believe you are, when you come into a Moed, your heart has to be broad enough to allow yourself to learn something new about the Torah. And it's really nothing new at all. It's just new to you because you never considered it was for anything else other than to serve yourself. And to demonstrate to others how correctly you could do something or keep a certain commandment. He says, no, learn to do good. You seek justice. You reprove the ruthless. You ever been around people just mean? You ever go into an assembly where there's just mean, sour people? It says, reprove that. That's not what it's for. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. The widow is someone who has no covenant relationship. The orphan is someone who has no father. Teach the orphan who doesn't understand the father. Connect that person to the father. And a father's love. And a father's discipline. And a father's reproof. That's always done in loving kindness. It's always done in chesed. Connect that widow to her husband. Show her like Ruth what it means to be a bride. Be patient while she learns and while she gleans in the word. Don't force. Don't pressure. Don't make fun of. Just like Boaz told the young men, don't you molest her while she's working and learning. She's learning to do good by gleaning in my field. Don't you be mean and ruthless to her. You be good to her. She's in process. She is a work in progress. And don't you dare do anything that is going to be an obstacle or an interruption to that process that she's going through. At our Moedim, devolving into arguments over things, envy, this way, that way, right way, wrong way, none of those things are going to bring life. It's you going to bat basically for those who are coming in who don't know, who don't understand. And it doesn't mean that you give up if they don't get it the first time. It means you have patience. You go with the pace of the nursing children. That's what Jacob said to Esau. You can't go any faster than that or you will kill them. They are human beings. We don't want to attend a Shabbat. He says, if you sin with your mouth, which houses that sense of taste, if you're presenting blood on your hands instead of that scarlet thread of redemption on your lips, then that cleansing water of the second Adam, how is that going to help you? You, you just got blood dripping out of your mouth because you've been sniping on people. But he wants to seal your healing. He wants your words to be like that scarlet thread. He wants to hear the good news coming out of your lips. He wants to hear truth. He wants to hear kindness. He wants to hear encouragement, those sorts of things coming out of your lips. He wants us to repent so that we don't have to be on the, the outskirts, the outside of the camp like a leper, thinking, why in the world didn't I just shut my big mouth? Why in the world didn't I have just a little more patience? Those aren't the questions we want to ask ourselves out there because if we ask those questions inside the camp and repent of it, then we don't have those quarantine periods on the outside of the camp where we ask them over and over and over. Thank you for tuning in to the Creation Gospel on Hebraic Roots Network. If you've been blessed by this program, please consider making a monthly donation to Break Roots Network as part of your monthly giving. 
You can give a donation at www.hebraicrootsnetwork.com or by calling 1-800-657-9820. Thank you. Welcome back. Let's continue looking at this redemption. That sign of redemption. Remember, your lips, they're like a scarlet thread because of the good news. That sign of redemption of Rahab's family was that scarlet thread. That not only was there good news for this household, but for those spies that she lowered down through the window, they were very different from the last set of spies that came back from Jericho with some very bad news. In fact, it was bad news that kept them out of the land for quite a while. So that shows you that even the spies, that message of their lips has been redeemed. Now, we often think about Rahab as a prostitute, because that's usually how it's translated. And Judah thought Tamar actually was a pagan temple prostitute when he gave her the scarlet thread. But when their son was born, he received that scarlet thread of redemption back from her. She's, she brings out the cord, the seal. And she says, whoever these belong to, this is the father of this child. Well, and that's a, a point in her pregnancy where she can't actually conceal it anymore. And he realizes that she's a virtuous woman, that what she did was actually redemptive work, that she stepped in and allowed her, her modesty, her faithfulness to be called into question for the plan, for the plan of redemption. And what it did is, even though he said that she's going to be burned, like the daughter of a priest who commits harlotry, once she brings out those symbols of his authority, he realizes that his authority has already covered her. By giving her those symbols, with, by giving her the staff, the seal, and the cord, those are basically his covering over her, his redemption of her. And she holds on to those. Because no matter what he said after that, the original word still covered. And so they're working together in redemption there. He's beginning to understand the process of redemption and what it means to have lips like a scarlet thread. Because he's saying, burn her, when he really should have been saying, she's more righteous than I. But he repented of what he said, and when he realizes, he finally does say, she is more righteous than I am. He changes the words of his lips, and by changing the words of the lips, we change our course. We change death decrees. We start speaking life instead of death. That scarlet is a picture of redemption as well as prostitution and sin. And by changing a decision, we can change that course from prostitution to redemption. That scarlet, the color of blood, it figuratively turns white when the family is redeemed from destruction. And there's some mysteries in there in terms of childbirth and uh, the instructions concerning the days of cleansing around childbirth because there are red days and there are white days when the blood is actually declared pure blood based on the number, based on whether it's a male or a female child. And so, at least for Tamar, what was going to be that, that blood red of death turned to that white transparent blood of purity. Her purity was acknowledged, but she had to take a step of faith. And that's, again, parallels that process. We can be in the blood of death, and yet it will turn tahor, or clear, transparent, repentant. Even though Tamar dresses as a prostitute, that's merely the exterior. But her actions are righteous. Judah says so. 
She is unwilling to see his name disappear from the earth. Remember what it says about the virtuous woman, that her husband, he's recognized in the gates. He's regarded. He has the respect of others because of the work she does on his behalf. Well, in Judah's case, she realizes if she does not act on his behalf to build his household, not only will he not have a name in the gates, he won't have any offspring to be in the gates. And so proactively, she makes a decision. Rahab is a prostitute. You realize Rahab is also a nickname for Egypt because of the prostitution factor? But yet, look at what happens in Egypt. Something pure is redeemed out of it. That's how Rahab is the picture. She goes out through those scarlet-stained doors. And so what we don't want is lips that are scarlet-stained with blood of evil. We want lips that are scarlet-stained like a crimson thread, speaking the good news of redemption and salvation. Now, before Yeshua's resurrection in the second temple, there was a phenomenon that was recorded on Yom Kippur. That scarlet thread was tied around the horns of the goats, and once that goat that was determined to go Lazazel was pushed to his death from the mountain of Beit Hararo, the scarlet thread that was tied on the doorway of the temple would turn white. Now there's conflicting accounts of that, but that's one of the legends that the scarlet would turn white when that redemption was accepted. And it says for 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the thread of scarlet never turned white. It remained red. So that tells you there again that work of Yeshua was a dividing point. Yeshua divided the scarlet harlot from the virtuous woman with the sword of the Holy Spirit. He'll do it again in the book of Revelation. Yeshua is the sword. Remember, it says that sword comes out of his mouth. It's who he is. He divides the knowledge of good from the knowledge of evil. He ensures that we no longer have intimacy with evil, but intimacy only with that which is good. And it's his definition of what's good, not ours. Not the nefesh, not that red nefesh. It's what the blue of heaven determines is good, and the nefesh will follow. Yeshua is the sword that's going to divide obedience from rebellion. Yeshua is the one who's going to rightly divide the word of truth from a lie so that we can do the same. We don't want to walk in lies and deceptions. It's through his work that we are going to be able to discern those things. In Revelation, it's saints from every nation, tribe, and tongue who wash their garments in the blood of the Lamb. But you realize they're still white. It's just like that scarlet thread of redemption. When it's accepted, and we know the blood of the Lamb is accepted by the Father. It is the only blood that is accepted by the Father. We can take a robe and wash it in that redemptive blood, and it merely turns it white, tahor, clean. But standing over against them, in opposition to them, are those from every nation, tribe, and tongue whom the beast has deceived. For one, there is the opposite. There is the adversary. There is the Satan. Between Revelation chapter 7 and 13, you see the difference between the virtuous overcomers and those who yield to the authority of the beast. It's in Revelation that Miss Scarlet Harlot is eventually going to be remedied in the earth. She is going to be exposed for who she is, and so is the beast. They are going to be revealed. Miss Harlot is going to be that stranger to the covenant of Adonai who not only has no desire to attach to the land, the covenant, and the people, but she attempts to deceive those who 
could be part of that group or who are part of that group. It says, if possible, even the elect could be deceived. She wants to be part of that deception. She's standing in opposition to the virtuous woman. And that is how we're going to be able to identify her. If she is leading people away from the land, the covenant, and the people of Israel, we know her identity. That is Miss Scarlet Harlot. That is not the valorous woman of Proverbs 31. It is not the Ruach HaKodesh. Let's read Revelation 17.3. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. That should sound familiar. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. There's that immorality of the stranger. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. So even John's in kind of awe and wonder of this woman and the work that she is doing. And he is seeing this work in a wilderness. Remember, Israel had to go into the wilderness in order to be tested and tried. And see, in, in the wilderness, which is where he takes each one of us, it's going to be revealed to us, because he already knows, whether we are still aligned with the scarlet harlot or whether we are aligning ourselves with the land, the covenant, and the people of Israel, whether we are going to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If we choose to serve the beast of our own desire and we are full of those blasphemous names, then we are distinguishing ourselves as indistinguishable. Remember, that's what a stranger is. A nakar is a, a false god. It's an idol. It's an image. But it's really nothing. And you can read that in the prophets where there's some prophecies where the people of the earth are going to walk by and look and say, is this what deceived and, and made everybody afraid? That's it? That's all? Well, see, a lot of people read Revelation and they're greatly afraid. But if you can identify the scarlet harlot and the virtuous woman with your own decisions, and you say, oh, is that it? That's part of it, is being able to discern in yourself whether you are acting in accordance with the scarlet harlot who merely wants to ride the beast of desire. Remember, the beast was the most cunning of all the serpent was the most cunning of all the beasts of the field. All right? As a beast who should have been subservient to the man and the woman, what he wants to do is to rear that ugly head, the head being important here. He wants to raise that head and take authority over the woman. A woman who is riding a scarlet beast is one who has submitted herself to the beast of her own desire, her own nefesh. That's why it's red. That's why it's in need of redemption. That's the color of the nefesh because it comes from the adama, from the earth. Adom is red. And so in these colors, you can see how she's behaving. Now here's how she'll fool you. She's going to dress up like you. So she's clothed in purple and scarlet, which also describes the virtuous woman, the work of the Holy Spirit. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, just like the virtuous woman, she was wearing jewels. Having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations 
and of the unclean things of her immorality. Now that's a clue. That's a breaking point. Because what, in her, what is in her hand is the seven abominations of the wicked lamp. But what the virtuous woman is going to have is a cup of sanctification. We call it a kiddush cup. We drink that kiddush cup at the feast. We drink it on Erev Shabbat. It's a cup of holiness where uh, in a marriage, the, the husband and his bride, they share that cup. And it's a cup of consecration where they're set apart for one another. The harlot, she'll be with anyone. Because of those abominations, she'll do whatever feels good at the time. But she's going to, on the exterior, look a whole lot like the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not total heathens you have to watch out for. It's the people who walk like you, talk like you, and maybe even dress like you. You have to continue to prove what they're doing. One way is listen to what comes out of their mouths. If you don't hear that scarlet thread of redemption coming out of their mouths, if instead you see the blood stains where they've destroyed people with their lips, then you know what spirit they're of. They need redemption. They need repentance. It doesn't matter how much red and purple they are wearing. It doesn't matter how cleverly their zit seed are tied. Who cares? It doesn't matter how correctly they've calculated a calendar. It's an abomination. It says that on her forehead a name was written a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Remember Sarah, the mother of many nations, the virtuous women that would be called out of the nations. But this is the opposite, the adversary, the Satan to that calling on Sarah and her offspring. The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And what is she drunk with? The blood of the saints. Want to guess how she got drunk? She's drinking their blood. The blood stains are on her lips. She's going to be speaking blasphemies. She's got all these blasphemous names. You know what a name is in Scripture? It's a reputation. It's a position. In fact, it's a conspicuous position. It's noticeable. Just like Miriam, she had a name. Miriam, the sister of Moses, she was included in lineage, which is rarely done with females in the scripture. But she had a conspicuous name because she had a very important job as a picture of the virtuous woman in Israel. Well, this harlot also has a conspicuous name, but they're blasphemous. In fact, that, those reputations that go with the names, that's what a name is. It's what you do. Her reputation, the deeds that she does, they are blasphemous because they are truly anti-Torah. Because Torah, only the letter without the spirit of the Torah is blasphemous and he hates it. He does not like it. In fact, the angel of the presence, remember Israel was warned, do not disobey or rebel against the angel of the presence. He says, my name is in him. It will be considered blasphemy if you disobey him. How do we blaspheme Adonai? Well, blaspheme Yeshua because the name is in him. He has that authority of the Father. And if you blaspheme the name of Yeshua, and you speak against his commandments, and you don't engage him with the love that he wanted you to engage them, then you're blaspheming him. Therefore, you're blaspheming the Father. You have to have the testimony of Yeshua and the commandments of God. You can't have one without the other. They work together. They're in unity. We have to be so careful as we see the day approaching. Because the, the truth of the scarlet harlot is that that beautiful appearance, it's just a deception. Her soul is bitter. Her nefesh is bitter. She hates people. 
She despises people. If she helps people, it's just to help herself and make herself look good. If she builds up anybody, it's just to build up herself, not anyone else. What does it say? Lamentation th uh, 319. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Now, what is that bitterness? Again, we're referring to several programs back, but remember how the Jews, when they were in disunity, they were pushed out, they lost the temple to the Greeks. It says, we wandered like beasts in the caves and the dens. All right, that affliction, that bitterness was because of their disunity. That, that unreasonable hatred of one another. That was actually attributed, the destruction of the second temple was attributed to unfounded hatred between brothers. The first temple was idolatry. My suggestion is those two aren't much different. Because if you have unreasonable hatred toward your brother, you're just serving yourself. That's all you're doing. You're saying my way or the highway? My way or no way at all? In fact, if you're not doing my way, you're sinning. That's, that's the easy way out. We can just pronounce on everyone, if you're not doing it my way, you're actually still in sin. Instead of you're reading it differently. You're trying to do it differently. But that affliction and bitterness, it'll cause us to be out there wandering like a beast. The description here in Lamentation 319, remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. When you're out there wandering in affliction, it is to bring you to repentance because what you're experiencing is wormwood and bitterness. Now, bitterness is rosh. Bitterness is associated with the maror, the bitter herbs of Pesach. But this is a different Hebrew word for bitterness. It's the rosh. And you know that the rosh also means the head. This person who's out there in affliction and wandering, they got a head problem. They probably got a massive headache. But that affliction that is suffered as part of the Passover season, it leads to a resurrection of the dead. If the spirit is is there. See, if the same spirit that dwelled in Messiah Yeshua that raised him from the dead dwells in us, then it says it will resurrect our mortal bodies. But what if we're going through Passover and that spirit is not being allowed to work in us? Which means we're not allowing ourselves to die. We're not putting that beast up on the altar. Well, you can put a clean beast up on the altar. You can be a wild beast out in the mountains. And you can wander in affliction and bitterness. I would rather eat the bitter herbs, put the clean beast to death on the altar at Pesach, and experience resurrection than follow that beast of my own wild desire out in the mountains. I want the afflictions that lead to resurrection, not separation. Afflictions of bitterness, they can follow the life of beastly sensuality. That's when you just let the beast run roughshod and dictate your life. But that is not an affliction that is going to lead to resurrection. Remember, you can suffer for the sake of the commandments and suffer for the sake of the gospel, but if you suffer for your own stupidity, that's pointless. There's absolutely no point in it. Those who are influenced by the harlot, their suffering that they do, there's no point to it. There's no resurrection at the end of it because they will not repent. Those afflictions are the result of a curse that goes with living a life of subjection to the spirit of the beast. It's submitting your head to the wrong authority. Accepting the head of the serpent caused a curse to come into the world because what Eve did is she accepted another authority other than Elohim. Who is the greatest authority on Adonai's word? Elohim or the serpent? 
the greatest authority on what he said was available to Adam and Eve. He walked with them in the cool of the evening. The serpent was not the greatest authority. He was not the one to quote scripture because he took a little nugget of it and he twisted it and he injected his own doctrine into it. The, the point of it being is I would like to rule over you. If I can get you to submit to my interpretation of what it means to be in the image of Elohim, then I can prevail over you. I can get what you want because that's what I want. I want to be on top. I want to have the authority. Anytime you add another authority, remember the earlier lessons, when you add another, you commit adultery. Eve committed a type of adultery, not in the physical sense that we think of adultery, but in the sense of adding another. When she let someone else get in between the relationship with her and Elohim, she added another. And that other twists and presents a different doctrine. And it brings a curse into the world because you can't have two heads. Either Adonai is the head or the serpent. Either Adonai is the head or the beast. We have to make up our minds. Curses occur when the harlot listens to and acts on the teaching of a serpent. Blessing occurs when the virtuous woman listens to the word of Adonai and acts on it according to Yeshua's precedent, the way that he walked in the commandments, with a lot of grace, with a lot of loving kindness. Adultery, remember, it's to add another. We don't need to add another twisted doctrine to all the twisted ones already in the world. The Hebrew word for scarlet, shani, it's the same as sheni, which means two. Shnei, achat, shtaim, well, the second, sheni, second in order, two. Instead of one, there's two. The curse comes into the world, and the need for the red, the crimson color red as redemption, comes because we have accepted two heads into our lives, two heads into our walk. There should only be one head. There is a, an order of authority, and the serpent and the beast should not enter in at any level of that authority. All authority the Father has given into the hand of Yeshua. He is the Messiah, not the serpent, not the beast. So separation is what happens on day two of creation. The two represent separation. But what we have to do is to be able to reconcile in Yeshua the unity of the body so that the Father alone is our head, so that the curse will pass out of the world. And certainly we want that curse to pass away from us. One head, not two in blessing, in unity. Hello, this is Dr. Halisa Elwine. I hope you'll check out all my workbooks at the Hebraic Roots Network shop. All of the proceeds from the workbooks, from our Creation Gospel products, they go toward missions, toward Torah-based missions in Africa and in India. This is very important to us that the Torah reach the nations, and you can be part of that when you purchase our products. I know that you can benefit from the products, but more importantly, you can be part of sending that Torah forth to the nations.